And good afternoon to uh, everybody out there. Today we have our uh, usual staff, uh, Annie Belisari, uh, realtor extraordinaire, Kevin Lohr, uh, mortgage broker extraordinaire, and myself, uh, host of VRS. So today I wanted to talk about a couple of things. And I know that this is, you know, closing up on the year, but uh, one of the things that I've seen out there and we've covered it in, on a couple of shows, but I think that uh, I, I want to expand on this. When you, and I want to start with Kevin and then go to you, Annie. Um, when you look at at people's debt when they go to buy a home, um, what do you? How do you? How do you approach that? And you know, whatever, you know, there's no c concrete way of doing it. I mean, um, one of the things I do want to cover today, and for those people that are listening, I want to cover something called the seven percent rule. Now. In the last, I don't know why this is, but in the last five to 10 years, especially since since the mortgage crisis of, you know, 2008 and since then, and the 7% the rule had stayed in effect, I think, since 1950s, it was a, it was a common practice. And what the 7% rule says is that if you have debt, um, you, you pay off debt that is higher than 7%. And if it's lower than 7% interest, you you don't pay it off. You just use the money because a, a, a if you invest in the S&P 500 or in the stock market, you're going to get a return of 8 to 10%. And that was that that stayed there for. And then last five to 10 years, we haven't shown that to a lot of people. And it just, you know, I don't know if it's because we're being less financially, you know, we're not as financially literate. We're, um, you know, we're on TikTok, you know, uh, you know, doing video. I, I don't know what the, the reason is, but the one thing that bothers me is that we're not teaching this to people and it, it's reverberating in, in home purchases, car purchases, like, uh, you know, that, that you guys were talking about that the guy bought a truck, drove it to closing. I'm like, I, I mean, at that point, I, you know, sell his heart and his kidneys to, to make up for it. But the, but people do those things. And what I want to talk about today is a, you know, how do you guys approach people that have debt and B, how do you approach, you know, what do you tell people that have, you know, how do you to approach the debt when buying a home and you know, what to do after with the debt after they do have a home? Yeah. I mean, typically uh, when I'm looking at stuff, uh, one of the, biggest times we're even talking about about debt is going to be more for like a refi situation uh typically with any credit card you're gonna i mean i think the lowest i've ever seen on a credit card was maybe like eight percent and that was somebody special that like worked with that company at one point but i mean typically most people that have credit cards the lowest you're going to get is maybe 12 and most people are around 18 19 20 percent on credit cards so you always want to start there when you're paying stuff off uh for a purchase we really don't get into it too much unless it's necessary to pay things off in order to qualify. Uh, someone has a someone has an extra money and they can pay things off in order to qualify for a larger purchase. I mean, that's something we'll talk about. But yeah, the seven percent thing. I mean, it's it's not something I usually touch on a lot, and it's kind of funny you say that with uh, just bringing it up recently because I, I have not heard it recently. But uh, I, I definitely agree with it. I mean, I try to convince people all the time. Um, I'll have people that are downsizing and uh you know they they go from a eight hundred thousand dollar house down to something that's maybe 250 300 and sometimes people just don't want to have the mortgage payment so they they use a lot of the proceeds but i always try to convince people you know like you were saying with investing that you're gonna if where rates are right now i mean they're climbing now uh, i mean rates were in the high twos i mean they're in the low to mid threes now i mean even i mean that's a, an incredible interest rate you can't go and borrow money anywhere um, at that low of a rate. So you're, yeah, you're absolutely correct. It makes more sense basically to get enough down payment so you're not gonna have mortgage insurance. And then it's obviously much smarter to invest that. But some people, you know, they don't trust the stock market and, and they don't wanna do that type of stuff. And other people would just much rather have a lower uh, mortgage payment so they don't have to have those expenses. But with tackling the stuff, paying things off, yeah, I, I definitely look at interest rates and I'll, I'll uh, recommend, obviously we wanna start at the highest rate it's and it's always credit cards it's just what it comes down to it is always credit cards so when we're able to do the the cash out refis that's just one of my favorite things to do for people because 
I've had uh, friends. I mean, I've, I've had myself where I've been in credit card debt. And when you've got a minimum payment on a, a credit card with a $20,000 balance, it's maxed out and you're paying almost 600 bucks a month for that. If you're able to roll that into your mortgage and your new interest rates, a, a three and a half, I mean, you can save people thousands of dollars monthly just by getting stuff like that paid off. Um, it, it is a little harder to convince people to not bring as much money for, for down payment and, and carry a higher balance on the mortgage when they've got the money. So that's just uh, that's something where I'll, I'll kind of direct them to a financial advisor as well. I've worked with a few uh, and I'm always willing to pair up with new financial advisors, too, because sometimes I think they need to hear it from a couple different people. Uh, and they, they're not just necessarily going to going to trust me when I say that. But when you when you hear it then from a financial advisor, it's it's kind of hitting home twice. On I'm going to tell you this. Um, you know, I've told people that, at the at, you know, at the same at the same time. And they they do not uh, they don't they don't listen either. They, they don't, man. And it's, I, I think it's and, and I've had and, and, you know, and, and people and, I, and I'm going to tell you this. There are two type of investors. There's accredited investors who have a net worth over a million and unaccredited net worth under a million. And that's how there there's no other class. I mean, that that's the you know the way that the SEC defines them. So I've seen unaccredited investors make really, really smart decisions. Mm -hmm. And I've seen accredited investors do some of the dumbest things. Yeah, I'll agree with you. It's it seems like the people that uh, have family money or maybe they were in a trust or something. It's for some reason when they have that money, it's it's hard to convince them to let their money work for them. You know, I mean, people right. who have a couple million dollars in a trust or whatever, you invest it correctly and you're getting ten percent. Uh, I mean, depending on the lifestyle you live, you can almost live off the off the dividends and and just yeah. your investment. I mean, you really yeah, on a million dollar home today. I mean, you know, let's just say that, uh, you know, that you bought a million dollar home. And and I mean, how many million dollar homes are in Columbus? I mean, there's, there's quite a few, you there's know, but I mean, I, I know, but I'm saying that there's not, you know, there's not a thousand million dollar homes in Columbus. I mean, there's, you know, probably, I don't, you know. Could you look look that up sometime, Annie? Is there a way there's, to join? I'd it? say I'd say there's probably more than a thousand, especially think, some of the new areas. Yeah, I think not only proper, but north. So Delaware County mm -hmm, probably definitely. had Delaware between Delaware County and the New Albany area. If you combine those, I would say that there's closer to upwards of two to three thousand. Um, you'd be really surprised, but, yeah. but that's, but that's also, we're counting that as Columbus. If yeah, you, outside, right. That's outside, yeah. Yeah. If you're talking that, Columbus, you know, more Columbus proper, a thousand might be a stretch. However, if you yeah. include Moore County, New Albany, right. you know, those, so the, that's a, the reason, the reason I was saying that is that the, the mortgage on right now, a mortgage on a million dollar home is going to run you what around nine, 9,000 a month. I mean, it just it depends on how much they're putting down and, and rate and everything. And, you know, it also depends if you're escrowing and including taxes. I yeah. mean, some of these some of these homes in New Albany or uh, Upper Arlington. I mean, you can you can be fifteen hundred bucks a month just on your tax bill. Right. It's, it's, if it's not more. Crazy. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the the issue, you know, like I said, going back to it is even, you know, if you if you put a million dollars in in, in the bank, and you, you know, drew out 10%, that's, you know, uh, that's, you know, you're going to make a hundred thousand a, a year. Mm -hmm. It's about nine grand a month, give or take, you know, right. and, and if you, you know, um, and that's why, you know, I, I always tell the story of that when we were, uh, when we were selling stocks um, and investments that the most popular investment at the time, and I wish it, it would make a comeback, but it's just not, um, was the railroad stock because they gave you, you know, they gave you a coupon every, you know, they paid dividends on it and then you still had the original stock and every year they, it would just, you had a coupon that you just, and then they would, you know, you would collect the, uh, the coupon rate. And I mean, it, it was, they were good stocks. I mean, they, they just, you know, a lot of people just now are just, it, they're not interested in them because they just don't, you know, you, you could go buy a, an NFT or, you know, something like that. It, you know, it, it's not, classy or flashy um i think the other one of the other things that too is that that i'm seeing is that people you know and this is something i i, I don't know there's not a never good answer and annie i i want your your opinion on this when you 
approach when a buyer approaches you you know let's just say that they've already gone and they've gotten a pre-approved letter let's just say that their pre-approval letter is five hundred thousand dollars right and and that's i'm just using that as a nice round number do you ever worry that you're you that a person is unsophisticated enough to get into a home and you try to say to them hey listen i think this might be a little bit more a little bit more home for you than than you actually need or yeah. you know they're going to be house you're rich and and cash poor do you ever do that i mean have you ran well, across it oh i run across it all the time especially in this market and people get their emotions so <laughs> crazy high um you know this is my approach on it i my fiduciary responsibility is to the client i am not allowed to say I'm not their financial advisor. I'm not their parent. I'm not their, you know, but I try to give the best advice possible just for them as a point of reference. And I will very, I tread very lightly with it, but I also, this is my thing is I don't want them to get super, super frustrated in six months down the road. And, you know, here I help them get into this house and everything's going to be hunky dory. And, and, and I could foresee what was happening. So then they're not going to be appreciative of my services when they, they realize what is happening. Um, so I always want to retain clients and I, I, I don't look at it as like, we have one transaction together and then thank you. Okay. I, I want them to be happy and repeat, um, come back to me. You know, it's a big, big investment. Um, so the approach I take, and I just had this happen. Um, I had somebody, we were paying a hundred thousand dollars over in a bidding war, no inspection. I said, I want you to take a couple hours. I need you to call your financial advisor. I want you to go over the numbers. And it was a huge, it was, you know, the purchase price on that house was 675,000. Like, so for me, that's a big paycheck, but you also have to realize it's about people. It's not just about your paycheck because I... I'm not going to push somebody to get into a bad situation. And, and I'm not, I'm not their financial advisor. I'm not, you know, so she reviewed all the numbers and it was a sound decision. So that's kind of how I approach it. Not all realtors are like that. A lot of realtors just want the transaction. They want the transaction. It's about the win. It's about the win. And I just can't do that. Um, in this market, it happens on ev almost every buyer transaction that there's some sort of decision you have to make. Okay, so our budget was 250. Now we're in love with this house. It's a bidding war. Can we go over to 285 and still be okay? And a lot of them get so emotional and they're like, yeah, we'll do whatever we can. Well, then you're stuck. Yeah. You know, then you're stuck. So that's how I I position it and, you know, and honestly, I will do whatever the client says. I can't say no. I'm not going to let you bid over. Um at the end of the day, I have to do what they want me to. However, I try to take every step to make sure that I'm not facilitating them into financial ruin. That that would just make me feel terrible. So, yeah. you know, but it happens people, all the time. Yeah, a lot of people do absolutely feel more pressured now with the, the competition where, like you said, they fall in love with something, the emotions are going, and especially if they've already been outbid on two or three other uh, deals that they've made and they, right. just, they feel like they want to throw everything they have into this purchase. And sometimes you just got to slow down and think, you know, yeah. if, if this was if this is a situation a year ago and if if I was going to buy this house, would I be putting myself where I'm putting all my assets into this paying twenty five thousand over? I mean, is this really what I want to do? The draining of the 401ks, the calling right. the grandparents. I mean, oh, every scenario lately. Yeah. And it's just like in some of these people, I'm just like, just slow down. Because yeah. it makes me nervous. So well, I had a we used to have it. Can't slow down either, because if you yeah. do, then you lose the house. But it's but it's, gotta, it's very it's very difficult yeah. right now. It's very emotional and it's it's very stressful. Very stressful. We used to have a. Uh, I got to tell you a funny story about draining the four hundred one ks. So I had a. Uh, um, um, I, I, you know, the you know back then too it was also when we were selling stuff. It was a lot different. You know, this is like twenty years ago. Um, but we had a, a, I would give them a card and I would make them carry it in their wallet. Okay. And, and it was just a, a little laminated card. 
and it had on there it says um are you dead or dying and you check a little box if you answered no to either one of these don't drain your 401k don't touch your 401k <laughs> and <laughs> because I, I you know we had a now the rules have changed on the 401k now the fiduciary rules but back when we were when um you you had you had to protect the client more so than you do today. Yeah. The thing that we were talking about was like, you would, you know, people would come and, and say, well, I want to take some money out for Christmas. No, no, you're not, you're not buying presents with your 401k. Or I saw the, you know, I'm no, you're not buying a car. You're not buying a motorcycle. You're not buying a boat. No, you know, this is, you know, but people would do that. And I, you know, and, and in today's market, you know, you go to buy a home and you know you i think you were telling the story i mean i don't know if we told you told the story or we were talking about this is that in the time that you took to meet a client at a house somebody had already written a contract in you know prior to you get you know prior to you get was, was that you were saying that happens all the time all the time yeah. yeah they were you know they literally in the time and, and it was like and people got frustrated it was like wait a second you know, in the time it took to go show the house, it was like a half hour. Somebody had already written a contract, it, you know, and was, you know, and people get frustrated. So, you know, they have, you know, 40, I don't know, you could have 50 to 100,000, 200,000 year 401k. You draw it out, you know, and you're like, I'm going to get this house. And it, you get into, you know, it's auction fever. And I've seen that and I've seen that in real estate auctions. I've seen that, you know, where or, you know, just regular auctions where people just get so upset yeah. that it, it's not about the, the item. It's about that you're not going to let somebody else yeah. get it. The adrenaline's going, the endorphins are flowing, and it's, yeah, you just, you get so tied up with whether whether you're just kind of buttheaded and you, you want to win, or it's just, you're, sometimes you're so wrapped up in it, you forget what you're even bidding on, and it's just that right. you want to win at that point. It's, yeah, yeah. It, gets, it gets really crazy and emotional. It really does. And that's the thing that I think I really try to to talk to my clients about is, you know, I will do whatever you want. However, I'm going to also, you know, give you the best. I, I'm very honest about it. You know, yeah. it's and I'll, and that's where I have a hard time with a lot of realtors is they look at it as a one and done. They're like, Just it's all about how many transactions they can make in a year. They don't care about the, the people. And and that's where it's like, ew, that's a that's a tough one for me to swallow. I just that's not how I how I run my business. But that's you'll and, and I tell my clients, you know what, I might be looking out for you and we might lose a couple houses, but you'll thank me down the road. You know, so it's a fine line and everybody runs their business differently. Um and I don't have any clients that have come back to me and said, you know, it didn't work out the way it was supposed to. I'm so sad I didn't go, you know, 60,000 over to fight for that house. So far, it's just been, everybody's been like, it has worked out exactly the way it should have, even though we didn't get X, Y, and Z. And that makes me happy, you know? Um, right. Yes, it's rewarding. Every yeah. situation right now, because there's a lot of people that have buyer's remorse after yeah, they absolutely is. Yeah, that's. I saw an article the other day about that where uh, this woman they interviewed just said, you know, I I've been in this house for two months and I absolutely hate it, and I got wrapped up in the moment, and that it happened, and it's been happening a lot because people just get so frustrated. You know, I've, I've had clients for over six months coming on a year that they they've put in offers, and you know they're. They're they're standing their ground where they they absolutely are not going to throw in this twenty five thousand yeah. dollar over asking price offer and you know right. you got to you got to be patient if you don't want to do that but then you also have people that are the complete opposite and they want out of their home maybe they're renting something that uh, if they have a big family you know maybe they're renting a house that's twenty five hundred dollars a month so you know every month that goes by uh, from a financial standpoint. You know, you're two months down the road where you're looking, that's five grand that could have been going towards building the equity in your home. So, you know, everybody's situation is different. If now, you're in a place that you're renting and wasting money, then it might make sense to you to pay more. Now, Kevin, I want to ask you about this. Um, do you do you ever recommend, and I, I don't know if this is, if, if veterans can do this, do you ever recommend doing the loan guaranteed prior to 
um, going through underwriting, everything to guarantee the funds. Um, I've been hearing a lot of that lately that, you know, um, they, they take the time to do everything up front so that they know the financing isn't going to fall out. Um, I mean, I, I typically, the way I issue a pre-approval, I mean, I've been doing this long enough where I'm not going to issue a pre-approval if I think there's a chance of it falling out. I mean, every letter that I've sent out has closed. I, well, I did have one where I got false tax returns, but no, well, I mean, I'm not going to. That's not your fault. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to over, over approve. You somebody. got false fa- tax yeah, returns. Yeah, was really, a, uh, was I a, find a, that hard to believe. It was two men that owned a cleaning company and uh, they, when we went to verify the, the returns, they just, you know, they were never filed. So, yeah. you know, I should have looked into it more, but we didn't, you know, I was just thinking that I was helping people out and they gave me the returns and everything else made sense. There were deposits in there, but they just, they were falsifying how long the company had been open and everything. So, but well, yeah, but, and that's interesting because you have a good reputation with the pre-approvals, but we're seeing like, we we just had one my partner just had one fell totally totally fell out of contract because the pre-approval they didn't look into anything you know a lot of a lot of companies so you got to remember uh every every company out there whether you're a bank or a broker independent mortgage company whatever you are everyone has their own policies right so sometimes it's not the the fault of the loan officer um i've heard of institutions where if somebody applies and you pull credit uh you have to issue an an approval uh basically just based on the information that they put on the application so i mean there there is a difference so a lot of people will throw the words around where this person's pre-qualified this person's pre-approved technically on a pre-approval you're supposed to look at documents have everything verified run it through the automated underwriting system uh on a pre-qualification basically what you're saying is what i just said where they've done the application everything looks good if this is accurate and true and if i were to collect the documents to prove it they're they're pre-qualified but you know you you really don't ever in this market want to accept a pre-qualification letter um Mm -hmm. to take that a little further what you were talking about with funds guaranteed i mean there's there's a play on words there it's kind of a verbiage thing i mean people will come up with all kinds of different ideas uh all the time i mean i i do it on pre-approval letters where i mean i'll call listing agents and let them know that um, how qualified somebody is. Um, we're actually uh, starting a new program at Revolution 2. We're calling it Buyer Ready, where what we're doing is taking a client who is a really very solid, um, and I can do it on anyone, but basically what we're doing is we're underwriting the file completely, not just the, not just the automatic, we ran it through underwriting. So yeah. there's a system you can run it through. It takes about 20, 30 seconds, and you'll get the approval. So what we can do is collect all the documents, get this uh, buyer underwritten fully, except for uh, having an address. So we're not going to have the property. So basically what we would do is have income, assets, um, all of that verified and fully underwritten. Then once we find a property, get an offer accepted, we order the appraisal, we order the title work. So, I mean, at that point, it's almost as good as a cash offer and we can close a loan in, you know, 10 days, two weeks, something like that. So that's, that's something that new yeah. that we're going to roll out, which is going to be an absolute game changer. So, I mean, that's, it's that's really good because it's yeah. like, how do we get? How yeah, do we we're, get? we're always looking for new ways to try to compete with the cash offers. And yeah. depending on how listing agents do things, uh, I think you and I talked about this once where a lot of times you'll pre order title uh, yeah. in, in central Ohio. You know, um, it's standard that the the sellers and the real estate agent on the listing side there would choose the title company. And that's good because what you can do is get ahead of the game, actually start getting that ordered. So, and you deal with one of my, uh, you deal with a good friend of mine. That's uh that's a title, Kara Snyder. And uh, her, her company is really a good, uh, you know, yeah, a, yeah, a, Kara and I are good friends. Yeah. Known her a long time. Um, and good. say that again. Yeah, no title. I mean, the title thing can be a big hiccup, big hiccup. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's, that's why it's smart. And that's why, you know, some, some areas, even in different parts of the state, um, titles done differently. So central Ohio, you know, it's standard that the seller chooses it. Seller actually pays most of the title fees as well, but you know, that gets you ahead of the game, gets the work started. So basically if you have somebody coming in and they've got a cash offer, a lot of times 
they'll still talk to a lender and that way they can get a letter saying, hey, I've looked at bank statements, I verified this person has this amount of money. Um, but when someone does that cash offer, a lot of times, if you don't want it, you don't have to have an appraisal with a cash offer. The point of the appraisal is to verify uh, the value is there and that way the bank is comfortable giving you the money. So that's something that you can get around with a cash offer. So that saves time and then the title work also. So if we have somebody fully underwritten and we're waiting on a property, uh, if I rush an appraisal, pay a little extra, I can have it back in uh, five to seven days, depending on how busy they are. But if title work's not started, I mean, that can take 10, 10 days, two weeks. I mean, I've had complications with title where it's taken two months. So if uh, if all the all the ducks are in the row and we do this, uh, this buyer ready program that we're getting ready to roll out here, um, yeah, we can we can definitely be very, very competitive with cash offers and you know, that's that's something that we're always trying to do because we want to be on top of things and, and make sure that our buyers and all of our clients are as competitive as possible. Because, I mean, that's what we talk about every time on here. It's just the market's crazy and you got to be able to be competitive. So it's going to be a game changer. But I mean, the, the whole guaranteed funds thing, it, it might be a play on words. I mean, I can tell you that I'll guarantee the funds on this person without if I get the automatic approval through the underwriting system. I mean, yeah, the funds are guaranteed. It's yeah. just people say things just to get yeah. your attention. And I mean, that's it's probably just a, a different way of phrasing something. I've seen lenders where um, they'll tell you that they'll issue a loan commitment with an offer, which, you know, the whole point of a loan commitment is you're supposed to be um, through underwriting the majority of it anyway. And typically when you issue a loan commitment, it's saying this loan's guaranteed to close uh, yeah. with the condition of what's always on there is you have to verify someone's in employment just verbally uh, 48 hours before closing. So mm -hmm. you might say loans clear to close. Here's your loan commitment with the condition of final verification of employment with the, within 48 hours of closing. So yeah. people are I've heard before where people uh, different loan companies, they would issue these loan commitments like with an offer letter uh, or not an offer letter, uh, an offer on a property. And it's like, yeah, I guess you can do that. But your loan commitment is going to have with underwriting approval, with title approval, with appraisal approval, you know, it's like, what's the point? I mean, it's once again, they're just doing something, which, you know, I respect they're trying to do stuff to, to get mm -hmm. someone's attention and, and put their, put their buyer in front of somebody else. I mean, I totally respect it. I, I think of creative ways to do that all the time as well. That's why I'll put more stuff on our pre-approval letters. And uh, that's why I call a listing agent. I mean, I've, I've told people that for, for uh, over, over a year and a half, I've been doing that now. And I, I tell, uh, other other colleagues in the industry other loan officers about it and people just don't want to do it you know it's yeah. it's the yeah. it's like oh why do you tell people you're you're letting your secrets out it's like well i've told a lot of people about it and not a lot of other people do it so it just comes down to whether or not they're lazy or how motivated they are but i mean i don't i don't ever care about sharing secrets and tips for people you know there's there's plenty of you know i i say that all the time i've had you know we give out so much information for free yeah um, I don't mind sharing info at all. There's plenty of business to be had by everyone. And, you know, and, you know we, lack of inventory is the problem. Well, we, you know, we had this, uh, you know, when I was, uh, when I was working, you know, like I said, I, I stockbroker, you know, financial advisor, people would ask me all the time, would, would, you know, I would give them some, you know, some advice for free others. I, you know, I told them I had to charge for them because it was, you know, part of the thing, but because, um, but, you know, people would ask me all the time, what do you think about this stock? Or what do you think about that? And I'm like, well, you know, this is a good, you know, look at what what, what do you plan on doing long term? Is it, you know, look at the PE ratio, look at the volume, you know, being sold. What, where, you know, where is, you know, where is the, you know, where's the market heading? You know, and it's just like this. I mean, today, you know, it's funny. And the reason I say this is that you've got to stay up with, you know, certain trends. One of the things that bothers me and, and I'm looking at today is that most there's a velocity curve and most consumers are about 18 months behind what other, you know, where, you know, smart investors are investing in. Yeah. Um, you know, for the longest time, I, I, I said Fang was the, the, you know, people were buying Fang stock, which is um, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix and Google. Well, as of today, TikTok is the number one uh, web visitor website in the world. So that, you know, that's going to affect Google 
and, and it's going to wind right. up, you know, you know, um, changing stocks. But the reason I say all of this is because I think one of the problems that is we can share information all day long. And, and this is, you know, what this what we're doing here. But is are people going to take it and apply it? Yeah, you know, I really I, agree with you. You know, there's a lot of people that, you know, they're like, uh, you know, some of these seminars that, you know, like Kevin O'Leary does and and you could go to them for free. Yeah. Um, you know, he'll tell you some trade secrets. Guess what? Ninety nine point ninety nine percent of the time people aren't going to do it. It's in you know, one ear and out the other. Yeah. You know, there, there are guys on, uh, you know, there's a guy I, I like I, I go to YouTube every once in a while and look up, you know, some business people. Um, and people will tell you, it's just like, uh, any, you know, the, the video that I, I you know, that I, I oh, sent yeah. to you, there are people out there trying to teach you about how not to do stupid stuff Yeah. and, and people yet again and again, they do stupid stuff. Um, you know, and you know, the one, the, the one, uh, banker that I, I she's a broker down in Atlanta. I like, I love listening to her, but. One of the things she pointed out was that she made a commission on a house um, selling a property and her commission was $137,000. Instead of investing that money or going out and, and buying a property to herself, using that as a down payment, she bought a Mercedes, a bunch or of clothes. Or half of it aside for taxes. That'd be smart too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, she she did that and, and, you know, she's a very, you know, very well-known celebrity. Um but the, the point that you, you think about this is that even smart people make bad mistakes. Yes, and if, finance that car. And if you're thinking, and, and listen, if you're listening to this and you don't think smart people make bad mistakes, let me tell you this. Bernie Madoff, who, who in, in, in the history of, of Wall Street, um, committed, you know, stole more money. The people that were investing with him were hedge fund managers, Goldman Sachs. Um, Bear Stern, I, I think Bear Stearns lost money with it. I mean, there were people out there that were very good at their craft that lost money with him. And so when I say to people, you know, don't, don't get upset that you make a mistake financially. Um, just don't make it such a mistake that you can't recover from it. And, and learn from it. You know, and I learn always from say it. that's the biggest thing. I mean, I make mistakes all the time and, you know, people, People in their careers, the longer you've been in it, the more mistakes you've made, the better you are at your job is what it comes down from. The biggest thing is, you know, mistakes are okay. I tell people that I, I train and help out all the time. It's fine to make a mistake, but make sure you learn from it. You know, and sometimes making that mistake, if something happens and you got to push back at closing, when that happens, you remember what you did and you learn from it. Sometimes it needs to happen in order for you to learn from it. Right. I'll give you, a, you know, I, I'm going to share this and, you know, we can, I know you guys have other stuff to do. You've got the WDE, WWE match going on. Uh, um, one, I, I'll give you an example. And, and this is something that, that happened yesterday. I, there's a, I have a client that I advise on. Um, he's got a real estate company and I, you know, I do some advising for him. I, I you know, I, I that so, poor guy. huh? That poor guy. Kevin, I know where you work. Just remember that, you know. Um, but yesterday we had a conversation. I, I told him about this, and, and this is the conversation. He has a, a, a home down in Florida. And he, you know, a couple, about a month ago, he said, hey, you know, should I, you know, I ran the numbers for him. And I and I said, hey, listen, I just, uh, um, i just going to, you know, run numbers. He makes $50,000 a year on his property, um, you know, renting it out. Um, he pays a, a ma management company about 25% of that goes to the management company. And, you know, yeah. they do like, and I said to him, I was like, I don't think that that's a good, you know, when I ran the numbers, the offset of him renting it out, you know, clearing 35,000 a year isn't worth him to keep that property because, you know, it's appreciated in value. It's time to sell. You know, maybe, you know, there is some, you know, maybe it's a better home for an investor in the 10 years. It's doubled its value and, and, and you know, and doubled its value. So now he can walk away from it. But everybody and the reason I, I bring this up is that you've got to look at have whenever you're doing a deal and, and you, you know, you're you know, you're buying a house, you know, getting more. 
have somebody take, you know, look at it a little bit, you know, oh, get, second look. Yeah. I mean, when you're yeah. wrapped up in a decision like that, I mean, like we were saying earlier with emotions going, I mean, anytime you're doing something like that, it's always good to have somebody take a second look, whether it's a friend or someone, you know, that's knowledgeable, right. but when it's, when it's for you and you're wrapped up in it and it's something that you want, you might not necessarily need it, you know, especially when you're talking investments or a second home primary residence. I mean, it's, it's usually smart for anybody to buy a house, but when you're talking about other stuff like that, then it, you know what it is, but it, you know, here's, here's the, the thing about buying a house you there for some people, you're better off renting, keeping mm -hmm. your, you know, your cost down. And then, you know, long-term now, I mean, if you, you look at the appreciation that, you know, I, I mean, and I think a lot of it is that we, you know, one thing we, we, you know, this shows for veterans, but it also a lot of the people that we're, you know, we're reaching out there, there's not a lot of th this stuff, you know, financing is finances are boring. It really is because, you know, you're dealing with compound interest, you know, yield spread premiums, you know, interest rates. I mean, you know, it's not as you know sexy as saying, you know, Pablo Escobar flying a, you know, a DC five, you know, from, you know, Columbia with a hundred million dollars worth of cocaine. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's, yeah, you know, it's, you, it can be a little boring. I mean, I, I try, you know, to you're going to own a property and you're going to have to change the toilet every, you know, you know, you're going to have to work on the toilet to make sure that, um, I, I, you know, I'll give you another little trick that a friend of mine that's a property manager uses is every month he go, you know, he checks on his property by going and changing the air filters on, you know, on properties because, you know, most people, but it's a way for him to get in the house, look and make that's sure that you get in there. Yeah. That's yeah, smart. That's smart. And, and, that, and that's just, you know, the, that's just a little ownership trick. And, and he said it's over the years it saved him. He, he knows the tenants. He sees, yeah. you know, they're not, you know, um, hanging, you know, um, I mean, you know, having a grow room in the back, you know, bedroom yeah. or stuff like that. And, it, and, but again, it goes back to, you know, when you're, you're doing financial, get some advice, make, you know, make sure that you're, you know, and don't, and, and again, if you're not dead or dying, don't touch your 401k. That's that's the you know the last part of it. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts for the no. new year? Um, um, I mean, something I always like to say at the end of the year if, uh, for self-employed people: um, if you have had issues qualifying for a home, um, it is a good time where you can think about uh, showing a little bit more money, maybe doing less write-offs. But now is an excellent time uh, to talk to your person who does your taxes or your loan officer. Um, I mean, I'm not a tax guy, but I can absolutely make some su suggestions. If you uh, maybe didn't show enough, you wrote off too much. Um, we can kind of figure out where your price point is. If you want to qualify for a $100,000 home, I can look at what's on your credit, how many debts you have, and basically give you some advice to show you what you need to show on the bottom line of your taxes. So this is a good time of year to talk about that for right. people that had qualification issues. Um, what about you, Annie? Um, just, you know, if you're a buyer or a seller, it, it is not a slow time right now. Do not think that you should be sitting around doing nothing. Um, you know, or if you're thinking about buying or selling right now is still, the market's still hot. We need people to sell their homes right now more than ever. Um, so if you're thinking about buying or selling, I can help you with that. And it's not, I mean, it's still going on. So it doesn't matter if it's the holidays, the new year, it's a great time to sell a house. I'm telling you that. And yeah. So yeah, just let us know. Well, and with that, we're going to uh, uh, sign off and we will um, again, thank you for listening to VRS and hopefully you learned something today. We'll be See you next year. Yep. Yeah.